Well, hello, my name is Marcus Green. I'm the Chief Executive of Action on Preeclampsia, the UK charity for those suffering with hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, including preeclampsia and HELP syndrome. Uh, we've come together today uh, to uh, recognise World Preeclampsia Day on May the 22nd. This is an important day for the whole of the preeclampsia community worldwide, and it is recognised in the United States, Canada, Mexico, Ghana, the United Kingdom, Australia, and all a whole host of other places. But today, what we're going to be talking about is some of the current issues in preeclampsia, some of the treatments that are available, um, how to avoid preeclampsia, and what's new. Uh, and with me, I have two extremely eminent speakers, Professor Andrew Shannon from King's College in London, uh, who has literally just come out of theatre, and Professor Jenny Myers from the University of Manchester, both of whom are leading researchers, uh, leading clinicians uh, at the coalface, and also uh, finding out some of the new stuff that's that's happening in the world of preeclampsia. So eminently qualified to join us this evening. Andy, Jenny, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Andy. May I start with you? Um, on our APEC helpline, we get a, a, a number of calls, a number of contacts, particularly from women who are concerned about aspirin. Um, can you dispel some of the myths, sort this one out once and for all? Should women be taking it? When should they take it? How often? What dose? What are the side effects? What do we know about aspirin and why is it so important in the treatment of preeclampsia? Well, aspirin's been around an awful long time, Marcus, and um, the great thing about it is it is very cheap and very simple um, and therefore available to a lot of people. Um, the key thing is um, it's given in a low dose, um, but that's known to be very good in a number of conditions, um, both in health. It, it sort of knocks out certain systems. Um, but it knocks out the bad ones more than the good ones. But it's very important to take the low dose, not just a normal kind of 300 milligram headache tablet. Otherwise, you knock out all the good stuff as well. Um, so in spite of it being simple and cheap, it does have quite an important, profound effect on certain pathways. And the great thing is it's been proven over some time now that pregnant women can take it safely. Um, and if given in low dose, um, it has some benefit in reducing certain problems. And one of those problems happens to be preeclampsia, particularly early onset preeclampsia. So we do recommend low dose aspirin to women who are at risk of getting preeclampsia. Now, it's, it's so safe, you know, you might say, well, why doesn't everyone take it? Well, I don't think we're quite at the point where we can say anyone can take it whenever they like, because it does have quite profound effects on many body systems. However, it's been around long enough and used in pregnancy long enough to be fairly um, concrete and been able to say it, it is safe when indicated. And what do we mean by when indicated? Well, if people have a risk of getting preeclampsia, and, and that means they may have an underlying condition um, or they may have had preeclampsia before, and the sort of uh, conditions or situations in which women may benefit from it um, is, for example, when women get older, say over the age of 40, or they, if they're overweight, they say have a very high body mass index of, you know, say greater than 35. Um, that sort of thing is known to be associated with it. And certain situations like having two babies or more um, is a risk factor and having underlying conditions like um, you know, antiphospholipid syndrome or diabetes or something you, your doctor would know, um, then we do recommend it. And it may work, work better in some situations than other, and there's a lot of research going on into the best way of deciding who should have aspirin. But there's no doubt that it is beneficial in some women. It is highly recommended. And, you know, there's a lot of debate on the optimal dose. The low dose of 75 milligrams was the original dose proposed there's increasing evidence that uh, a bigger dose of about twice that 150 um, is probably worthwhile and equally as safe but you know it does affect your clotting and therefore you need to take it under supervision and be recommended it um, and make sure that there aren't situations when it shouldn't be taken so it does have to be done under medical supervision or certainly um, under sort of maternity care being aware of it and recommending it. 
So in an ideal world, a, a booking visit, for example, um, a midwife might recognise the risk factors uh, and suggest low-dose aspirin um, to be taken. Um, is, is That's the way it works? Yes, I mean, the, the midwife is likely to know the situation in which a woman would be recommended it. Um, but it's sensible to have a referral to, to a medical doctor, an obstetrician who will talk through the relative um, risks and benefits of taking it and then prescribe an appropriate dose, as well as, you know, advise on other factors that are required for that particular pregnancy in terms of monitoring. So um, it needs to be done under supervision rather than just bought over the counter. Um, in fact, my, you know, pharmacists wouldn't, wouldn't supply it if they knew you were pregnant. Um, so it, it must be done under supervision. Thanks very much, Andy. Um, Jenny, we've just spoken about one of the things that um, we know helps, but uh, you're about to start what sounds like a really exciting project uh, called Starship, which is looking a little bit more at aspirin. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what's involved with that uh, and what you hope to find out mm -hmm. and who's involved with it? Yeah, great. Um, thanks, Marcus. So the Starship trial is going to be launching later this year. It's very exciting collaboration between many investigators around the country, including Andy and myself. Um, APEC are a very important partner um, in the study, and it's going to be run um, and managed by Nottingham Clinical Trials Unit. Um, and what we're going to be doing is comparing a newer screening method for identifying the women we've just been talking about. So those women who are at higher risk of developing preeclampsia, we're going to be looking at comparing um, outcomes for women who are screened using our um, traditional methods, which we currently use in clinical practice, which um, follows the NICE guidelines. The NICE guidance is set out in the UK um, and assesses some risk factors as Andy was just talking about for women who've got um, things that might make them at higher risk of, of getting preeclampsia. Currently those women would be recommended to take low dose aspirin. Um, the Fetal Medicine Foundation have um, designed a newer screening test which includes the same maternal characteristics, um, so the same questions asked of the woman at the beginning of pregnancy but also measures her blood pressure um, measures some blood flow measurements on the first trimester scan, so that early dating scan, um, and also measures um, placental growth factor, which is a hormone produced by the placenta, which we can measure as early as the first trimester. And when you put all of those things together into a, uh, an algorithm, um, then you can identify more accurately which women are going to go on to develop preeclampsia. So the, the evidence would suggest from the um, studies that have been done that the Fetal Medicine Foundation algorithm is a more effective, more accurate way to identify those women who would benefit from aspirin. And that actually about the same number of women up and down the country might need to have aspirin, but we would get it to the women who are at the highest risk. The problem is that the, the logistics within the NHS and within um, maternity care of introducing a new screening test needs to be very carefully considered. Um, and this screening test includes um, an extra measurement taken at the scan and it includes an extra blood test. And those things come at, at significant cost. Um, maternity services are enormously stretched at the moment. Um, there's only so much money to go round. We, we work in a constrained services and um, we've got to be absolutely sure as healthcare professionals that introducing um, this test and spending an extra 20, 30, 40 pounds um, on each pregnancy, which will add up to many millions of pounds per year across the UK. We've got to be absolutely sure that that is um, effective, that the screening test works when you roll it out into routine hospital care um, and that we get we make all of those savings back by actually preventing more cases of, of preeclampsia. And that's the crucial thing. That's what we all want to do. That's what gets us out of bed in the morning. We want to prevent this horrible condition from affecting any women. Um, but we've got to, uh, we've got to make sure that this screening test is introduced responsibly um, and that we have fully evaluated um, how well it can be implemented. So that's what the study is all about. It's going to run in 18 hospitals um, across the north of England and the East Midlands um, and we'll be capturing information on around 200,000 um, pregnancies. So it's going to be um, 
a, a really exciting opportunity to hopefully demonstrate that this is a much better screening test, well worth the extra money, um, and that it's beneficial to to all of the women, um, and it doesn't have any negative impacts on um, on pregnancies and women's experience of pregnancy. So alongside the, the the trial itself, you'll be doing a lot of um, work on the economic analysis of it uh, and seeing if there is that cost saving to be made. Yeah, that's right. So there's a built in health economic um, evaluation, which allows us to look at the, the costs of the test itself, um, how long it takes, the impact on services and, and really importantly, um, the clinical outcomes and, and whether we reduce the number of babies that are born early because of, of preeclampsia. Um, so that'll be the clinical outcome and that'll be um, part of the health economic analysis. We're also going to do quite a lot of qualitative work so that we can um, talk to women about their experiences of screening for, for preeclampsia, um, get their um, their views on, on the different screening tests, on, on the, the advice that they receive about taking aspirin um, and really understand what the potential um, issues are for women that can help us to improve, um, you know, the delivery and the effectiveness of these interventions in the future, because that's really that's a really important part of of how we get interventions into practice and how we make a difference. Excellent. Thank you. You mentioned two things there, which uh, I want to bring into our discussion uh, in the next few minutes. The first one was placental growth factor testing. We'll talk a little bit more about that as, as the uh, discussion progresses. But uh, the other thing was blood pressure monitoring. Uh, and that is a linchpin of what what we're about, isn't it? Um, Andy, you've been researching preterm birth and preeclampsia for more years than perhaps you care to admit. Um, and you've done a lot of work around um, blood pressure monitoring um, and with the cradle trials. And what have you been finding out? What 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 has that shown us? Well, Marcus, as you say, blood pressure is quite an important component. You know, it, it's how we rely on screening in general populations uh, who are pregnant about do they have this problem we're concerned about. Um, and so, so we need something simple and cheap and easy to tell us when to kind of up the ante and start looking further at whether whether they potentially have preeclampsia and whether this is serious and warrants more action. Um, so it is a hallmark of, of the syndrome of preeclampsia, um, measuring blood pressure everyone knows about, but um, pregnancy does have some challenges. You have to have use devices which are specifically designed for women because um, they do read differently um, and so on. So, so my research over the years is kind of indicated that we have to rely on um, monitors that have been specifically designed to be used in pregnancy. Um, but the key thing is once you've identified a woman who is at risk, that is when we can help them. Um, and obviously we've talked about aspirin and obviously prevention is better, better best way of kind of de dealing with the problem. But in those women who get preeclampsia, which unfortunately is you know a large number, um, we have to manage them well. And the great thing about preeclampsia, although it is known to be a killer, both to mothers and babies, if, if you know it's coming and if you manage it well, you completely turn it around and it becomes really safe. So, so it becomes very rare for a mother to die. Um, and there are lots of things we can do to help the baby. Um, and so delivery is, is the sort of um, way, way to do that. Now, the Cradle projects are a number of projects. There are you know, six now, in fact, um, both about the device, about mon monitoring blood pressure, but also what do you do with that knowledge? And of course, the key thing is not just to measure blood pressure, but once you know someone has raised blood pressure, we need to know what to do about that. And one of the key things is when to deliver somebody, delivering them early, might be dangerous because the baby's premature and you don't want to do that too early but equally you don't want to wait so that so that the baby goes into more danger or the mother becomes in jeopardy so a lot of our work has been looking at the best time to deliver and we've been working out that you know delivering a little bit earlier can be done once you have a confirmed diagnosis of preeclampsia um, and we've taken those studies to the world now in the cradle four trial and actually shown we can save a lot of babies and, and prevent maybe three quarters of stillbirth um, in that late pre after 34 weeks by delivering people in a timely way if we get the diagnosis right. So, so simple research, but but life saving research. And um, you know the large teams that have been working around the world um, can, need to be thanked for the huge effort they've done to to get those results.
Tremendous, thank you. Um, let's move on to placental growth factor testing. Um, and I want to bring both of you in on this. Uh, I first of all think we need a quick summary of what PLDF testing is, how you use it to, for, for diagnosis, when it's used. Um, so can you talk, can you both talk us through um, PLGF testing and why it's important? Yeah, so um, perhaps I'll, I'll start. So we've already mentioned that placental growth factor is a hormone produced by the placenta all the way through um, pregnancy. And so you can measure it in the first trimester and it gives an indicator of, of um, those placentas which have perhaps not developed as well. Um, and preeclampsia, after all, is a condition um, that's caused by the placenta and caused by, by damage to the placenta. And, and sometimes if the damage to the placenta happens quite early on in the pregnancy and the placenta doesn't get developed um, normally, um, you'll have low levels of placental growth factor as early as the first trimester. And that is why it's a useful screening test for those women who are going to get early onset preeclampsia, by which we mean preeclampsia happening um, often before 34 weeks or certainly before 37 weeks into the pregnancy. But later on in pregnancy, you can also use placental growth factor and another hormone called, uh, we nickname soluble flit, um, which is also produced by the placenta. You can measure those hormones later on in pregnancy to make a diagnosis of preeclampsia. And that's where we've got really, really solid evidence from a number of observational studies and also interventional trials um, that using um, placental growth factor on its own or using placental growth factor in conjunction with soluble flit is a very accurate way of identifying women who are developing preeclampsia. And really importantly, it's a really, really useful test for identifying the women who aren't developing preeclampsia. And we should just, you know, just give a moment to, to, to think about that and how that's useful because in women who present in pregnancy who perhaps have got a change in their blood pressure or have got some abnormal um, blood tests, um, and the doctors and midwives think that they might be developing preeclampsia, quite often it's not actually preeclampsia, it's it's something else that's going on, perhaps underlying medical disease or a different pregnancy complication. And so um, measuring placental growth factor and, and soluble flit is a really, really accurate way of being able to say this isn't preeclampsia and therefore we don't need to be, you know, thinking about perhaps admitting you to hospital or, um, you know, thinking about you needing to have your baby in the next few days or few weeks and you can return those women to um you know a lower um lower intensity of, of surveillance so it's it's really useful both as a positive test and a negative test to help guide our judgment um and so we we're now using it um in lots of hospitals um in in england and um, we're going to talk about um what we want to do to try and improve access to to that test uh, for for all all women um, who are at risk of, of developing preeclampsia. Andy, do you want to come in? Yeah, Mark, I just want to add, I mean, I absolutely agree with everything Jenny says. Um, but the, 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 I mean, just to put it into context, it really is a preeclampsia test. And, and we've been looking for this for, for many, many decades. You know, we've done blood tests looking at whether the mother is sick, whether her different organs are being affected or whether the baby's being affected. But we've never really had the upstream this is really the disease test and here it is and it's arrived and so it's quite a challenge for us to say wow we've got this fantastic test how do we now use it to help us and as jenny says if right from early on in pregnancy it can tell you that, that a problem is coming and so it's really critical that we don't overreact and then start jumping on people and doing things too early that can cause problems like early delivery is not good for the baby if it's before it's necessary um, but at the same time, it really allows us to to sort of reassure and not overreact on the many people who don't need need to have things done. You know, we've talked about blood pressure being a really good test, but actually many people with raised blood pressure will never have a problem. And all, also, there are people who now present with other features of preeclampsia. Maybe the baby is small or they have headaches or, or protein in the urine, but don't yet have blood pressure. And this test will tell you very reliably this genuinely is underlying preeclampsia causing those things. And it allows your clinicians to decide who to you know, worry about, who has to come in and have more intensive surveillance, um, and ultimately you know, who may need delivered. One of the very exciting things for me is that 
around the world where where diagnostics are quite expensive and challenging, even simple things like dipsticking the urine um, often doesn't happen. If we can get these these really reliable tests into a very cheaper usable form, we have a single test that will tell us very reliably who needs to be you know looked at and delivered and who doesn't, and that makes a big thing for most of the world where it's it's very costly and dangerous to deliver early when you don't have good facilities. Okay, so so if you imagine a woman at say thirty four weeks uh, or two women at thirty four weeks who present in clinic with exactly the same symptoms, um, normally up until now you would have treated them exactly the same. Now a PLGF test can say right, we need to provide more care for this uh, woman, but for this woman you can go back to normal care uh, and we carry on. Uh, without worrying too much about uh, the likelihood of developing uh, preeclampsia. That, that's how it works, isn't it? Uh, and that's where the cost saving comes in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, it gives you the ability to, um, to, to design the care that's right for that individual woman with much more accurate information. So, you know, there was always an element of, you know, we used to get it right most of the time because um, people get well, you know, get good at, at, at being able to look after women. But often that would have meant that women were coming far more often than they needed to. Um, whereas now we can manage women who've got high blood pressure but haven't got preeclampsia. We can manage those women with remote support for their blood pressure monitoring at home, for example. We can We can keep women from unnecessarily having to come to antenatal day units um, unnecessarily for multiple visits and we can use that resource to look after the women very carefully who actually are developing preeclampsia and as Andy said when you get this blood test and it's abnormal that doesn't mean you need to have your baby that moment but what it does mean is that we now need to be watching you very very carefully assessing you assessing your baby every every day every couple of days and so that we can get the timing exactly right and we can prepare you and your baby for birth, you know, getting the timing of things like steroid injections right, getting um, magnesium um, medicines in that, that are often given before a baby's born prematurely. So it's about really optimizing and, and it's these are incremental gains, but they make a massive impact actually when they're delivered across the country because they really mean that we're keeping mums safe, um, we're, we're identifying babies and We've had multiple, countless now, um, since we've been using the test in our hospital of women who wouldn't have quite met the diagnosis clinically. Um, you know, perhaps their blood pressure hadn't quite reached that magic 140 over 90, or perhaps their urine test hadn't really got that much protein in. But the blood test gives the clinicians a certainty of the diagnosis, you know, when you know it's coming and therefore you can act at the right at the right time so it it really makes a huge difference to the management um of these women marcus the clinical trials we've done on this have have basically proven what jenny is saying if you show if you take these tests on women and show them to the clinicians and hide them from the clinicians if you look at the women who are managed with knowledge of the test they end up being managed better and having better outcomes compared to ones where those have the test aren't shown to the clinicians. And that's unusual to have a test improving outcomes as opposed to a treatment improving outcomes. Um, so, so it is a remarkable test that has good evidence base in terms of being proven to save money, um, as well as this huge benefit of reassuring or directing care appropriately. Um, and, and so, yeah, we like it. And, and we should be proud of the fact that I think the UK has led the world in getting this out to the population um, it's not quite good enough yet, as we know, but, um, you know, I think we're leading the way and other people are now catching up. Thank you, Andrea and Jenny. And I think one, one of the things that's really fascinating, I'm going to pull you up on this, Jenny, is you use the word certainty. Now, the whole thing about pregnancy and pregnancy care is varying shades of grey. Yes. <laughs> and probabilities and possibilities. But yeah. now... With this PLGF test, we're talking about certainty, uh, and that is a remarkable achievement, isn't it? Yeah, and and we certainly don't have much certainty in pregnancy care. That's absolutely you're absolutely right, Marcus. And this test, because it's upstream, as as Andy said, it 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 reflects how the placenta is working. And so, very often in my clinical practice, 
we'll 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 do this test because there's just something that's just not quite right maybe a small change in the blood pressure maybe something subtle and the test is is abnormal and the woman hasn't got preeclampsia yet but you know with certainty that if you watch and you wait and you monitor and you support that woman over the next sometimes it's days sometimes it's weeks you know it can be many weeks we have not yet in all of the reviews we've done and in the clinical trials and the observational studies when these markers are abnormal the outcome of the pregnancy eventually you will always find evidence of of some damage within the placenta that's triggered that um that change in those biomarkers so you know it gives you certainty that there is something going on with the placenta and as ever there are lots of nuances and lots of you it's a test that needs to be used by experienced doctors and midwives who understand how to interpret the test, understand how to manage women who've got either a very abnormal test or a, an intermediately abnormal test. And it needs to be used in the context of the whole clinical presentation. You know, the gestation of the pregnancy will make a difference, all of the other features um, that you that you'd be assessing on that woman. So it's 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 not a magic balance on its own but used in conjunction with the rest of that assessment it really allows you to to have really much more confident and much more informed conversations to tell women what to expect and and what what's going to be needed excellent excellent now can i just talk about where we are in terms of the united kingdom in in, in terms of where where we're at of getting plgf testing out now, in England, uh, my understanding is around 85% of women who need to access this test can do so through their, their, their clinicians deciding that it's a good thing for them to have that test. Unfortunately, uh, in the island of Ireland, almost nobody can get it. Uh, in Wales, almost nobody can get it. In Scotland, almost nobody can get this test. And that's concerning me greatly. Uh, and this is why on World Preeclampsia Day uh, 2024, we are launching a campaign called Clark's Campaign. We're, we're recognising Clark. Clark uh, was born to uh, Stuart and Amy in Erskine uh, a couple of years ago. And unfortunately, he was very, very premature and he uh, died at 12 days old. Uh, and we know that uh, had placental growth factor testing been available, it might have made a difference. And we know there are lots and lots of parents for whom they are living with the consequences of locally PLGF testing not being available. So we're launching a big campaign and we're calling on the Scottish Government to implement placental growth factor testing. And if you go to our website, apec.org.uk, you will be able to see right at the top of the website uh, a, a link for you to sign that petition, which we will be presenting to the Scottish Government uh, to really put pressure on the boards. The Scottish Government have said to health boards that they should be implementing it, but there isn't a single health board who is implementing it. Uh, and we we want to understand the reasons why, we want to get to the bottom of it, and we want to see that implemented throughout the United Kingdom, because as Andy says, we are leading this. Uh, we have led the world on percent of growth factor testing. It is certain, as Jenny says, so we need to get this test out there. Now, moving on from that, um, we know at the moment that, that how do the tests work, Andy? Um, how if you decide a patient uh, would benefit from PLGF test, what happens then? How does it work? Uh, and how do you think that's going to change in the years to come? Yeah, I mean, I, I think like any new thing, Marcus, there's a learning curve with working out its optimal use, and I think, um, We've done that, you know, I, I just reflecting on your kind of postcode lottery issue, uh, new things come and go all the time and you can understand why policymakers might um, be a bit, you know, reticent about jumping on every new idea. But but the thing about PLGF is it's been around the mill or well, through the mill, should I say, about, you know, it's, it's economic benefit, it's clinical benefit um, and NHS England do not lightly back things you know, with their various bodies, unless it has very, very strong evidence of all those things being okay. So, um, you know, there's no doubt that it has a use and that use is evolving. And you know, now you ask, you know, how do we use it? That is evolving. There's no doubt that people who come in with suspected disease, as we've discussed, we're, we're a bit unsure about 
you know, should we, shouldn't we do things? That is where, where it is. There's a lot of potential use in many, many other groups, including early on to decide, you know, should they get aspirin and including later in terms of, you know, how we should manage them. Does it help um, with, you know, small babies? All this sort of stuff is, is new. And there's even kind of therapies being developed to alter it to see if that's going to um, improve outcomes because it's so fundamental to the sort of real pathology of preeclampsia that it that it may be worth even changing it as a treatment as opposed to a test to tell you it's coming. Um, the key thing with all these tests, Marcus, as you say, is it, they need to be accessible, they need to be easy to use, people need to understand how to interpret them, they need to be cheap. Um, so what we're working hard on at the moment is, is to that evolution of taking what is you know, a, a costly test in the laboratory, try and bringing it closer to the patient, what we call point of care testing, and, and try to make it easier to use. So instead of having to spin blood um, to, to get plasma or serum, you can actually do it on whole blood and even moving to a finger prick. Um, and also bedside analyzers that are simpler and cheaper. Um, so, so there's a lot of research going on and actually in the not too distant future, you know, I don't think we're years away, I think we're months away, um, of having better tests um, or, or similar tests that are actually uh, more effective simply because they can be accessed quicker and much more cheaply. Um, so that's a very exciting development. Fantastic. So the future is very bright. Uh, we, we should be seeing a lot of, of changes coming through. And um, that is that's fascinating. We've talked about blood pressure. We've talked about aspirin. We've talked about PLGF. Um, Jenny, moving on from all this, this is an exciting world to be in. It's an exciting. There's 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 lots going on. Um, what else is happening in this world? Yeah, well, um, I think we've talked about um improving prediction and um prevention, and there's there's trials going on looking at um other molly other treatments that help prevent preeclampsia. So, for example, there's a trial going on across the UK at the moment called the CAPE trial which is looking to add calcium to aspirin to, to try and reduce the risk of preeclampsia developing. And that's going to involve over 7,000 women in, in, the, in the UK. Um, there are also groups around the world um, thinking about trying to use other treatments like um, statin, uh, which has got a, an increasing body of um, safety data and um, to suggest it's, it's safe to be taken during pregnancy. So um, statin treatments um, may be coming. They're going to be tested as, as whether they might help to reduce the risk of, of preeclampsia developing. As Andy's just suggested, there are um, companies developing uh, really fancy, really new and exciting ways of actually reducing the amount of soluble flit, which is the bad molecule that comes from the placenta. So when the placenta is damaged or or stressed, we often say it produces really high levels of this um, hormone called soluble flit. And that soluble flit molecule is at very high levels in the mum's body. And that's what causes a lot of the blood pressure problems. It causes lots of changes with the organs um, in the mum. And it's probably part of the reason that, that women with preeclampsia can get so sick. And so really exciting treatments may be that we can give a, um, a single injection that would reduce the amount of soluble flip being produced by the placenta um, and and potentially you know give us much more time for the baby to be um to mature and, and delay the need for for having to deliver the baby early so that's in very early phase testing um and and so won't be a, a clinical treatment for many years yet but it's really exciting that we've got companies developing these new molecules and that pregnancy is not getting left behind you know that we're getting pregnancy um in the mix for for these you know really uh, novel and exciting uh, potential treatment strategies i think the other thing that's just worth a quick mention is is what's happening after women have had preeclampsia as well because we know that women who've had preeclampsia do have big changes in their um cardiovascular system um, and that needs very careful monitoring after the pregnancy. And we know that women are at slightly higher risk of developing longer term blood pressure problems um, and that the effects of preeclampsia can last um, for many years, perhaps even a lifetime for some women. Um, and we need and there are many groups um, of researchers around the, the world thinking about better ways of trying to improve women's longer term cardiovascular health 
after preeclampsia and, and drugs like ACE inhibitors and other um, newer drugs which are used to treat um, conditions like diabetes, for example, might be really useful after pregnancy for women who've developed preeclampsia that may have a really profound um, effect on their future cardiovascular health. So I think there's a, it's fair to say there's a lot going on, Marcus, um, and APEC are at the centre of a lot of that research. Um, and, you know, we'll have much to talk about at, at World Preeclampsia Days in the future. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um... And I'm, I'm really glad you highlighted uh, some of the long term health complications. Uh, I think one of the messages that we we think is important at APEC is that um, after you've had an episode of preeclampsia, you really ought to be keeping an eye on your, your, your blood pressure, not for six months, not for 12 months, but for the rest of your life, really. Um, and if, you, if your blood pressure is heading in the wrong direction, if it is heading up, then talk to clinicians about it because they need to know about that. Uh, and it is that early warning, isn't it, that, um, that that's, uh, of, of things that could happen in the future. So good for everybody. So is there any way women can actually avoid getting preeclampsia, do you think? I mean, we know the risk factors, Marcus, and there are underlying... You know, okay, so Andy, just run through what those risk factors are. So there are underlying characteristics in an individual that increase your risk. And that said, of course, anyone can get it. So it's not like a guarantee. But, but you know, one has to get the public health messages out um, that people who are healthier, who are a more optimal weight, both, you know, being overweight is not a good thing for preeclampsia. Um, older women um, will also get preeclampsia. Um, so, so, you know, looking after those things that we know are better for you, um, you can't always choose when you have your pregnancy and, you know, it may be difficult to lose weight and so on, um, but, but it's a very important to, to try and make sure that they are optimized. I think all the things we've talked about, the prevention, the identification will always remain critical because there will always be people, even with no risk factors at all, who will get preeclampsia. You know, just adding on to the research things that Jenny's talking about, that's really exciting new things coming through. But actually, preeclampsia has always been prone to inequalities. Um, you know, whenever you've looked at the stats over the years, it's highly related to some groups getting it and some groups not. And that in itself tells us that active things we do and active management we do can make a massive difference. Um, and, and if you look around the world, the, the differences in, in outcomes are just staggering. It's one of the huge injustices in this world that something that is actually avoidable is not avoided in some places because of those preventable factors and because of the care not, not being optimized. So I am, I'm also very, very keen, and there is good research going on, not just on the exciting new kind of, you know, reducing the molecules, but also doing what we know already better identifying people, acting promptly and appropriately, because that's the real lifesavers. You know, you, the differences across the countries and across the world are just because we're not doing what we know already uh, properly. And that type of implementation and other research is as important and also, also very exciting. We just have to get the message out to the whole world as well about what we know, what we know works. <laughs> But within the UK, um, I, and the Embrace reports have shown uh, some very interesting racial disparities over uh, recent reports. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and, um, and what what they're saying, and um, why there needs to be some some significant recognition of this as uh, at the moment? Yeah, and and I think this is really gathering pace and we're having conversations about these inequalities um and and you know we need to be having these conversations and like like all things it it is it's multifactorial so you know there are um there are some real biological differences and the analogy i often use in in conversations is that diabetes and gestational diabetes for example are are much more common in in some groups of women so our south asian women are much more likely because of their genetic disposition uh, to, to develop uh, insulin resistance and gestational diabetes. And many of our um, Black African and Black Caribbean women 
are more likely to have high blood pressure problems and to come into pregnancy with high blood pressure problems. And also the, the evidence would very strongly suggest I'm much more likely to develop preeclampsia. So there's a biological difference there that we don't fully understand and we need to do a lot more work to understand um, those biological differences. But layered on top of that, perhaps, are all of the inequalities of care. And some of that might be about um, access to care before pregnancy um, uh, for women who are moving around um, who may not have had their high blood pressure treated, for example. That that So that's just one example of many different inequalities in access to care. And also, we've really got to tackle this issue of are, are we giving the same care and the same access and making our care um, accessible um, and making it as effective in all of the women who access our services. So I think that's a real focus. And as Andy says, it's about doing the right things, you know, sticking to those basic principles that we know save lives, making sure that the information about the warning signs for preeclampsia, for example, are out there, making sure that um, we're providing information in a way um, that it that doesn't exclude certain groups of women. So we we need to be tackling all of those things in tandem. I think the biological differences, um, the disease itself, um, and and also the way we're delivering care and the, and ensuring that um, all women are encouraged to access care and that they that all women are listened to. Um, so that we we try and level up some of those um, disparities. Thanks very much. Um, looking, uh, I, and I imagine the watching this is going to be quite a number of women who uh, either have had preeclampsia or are concerned about developing preeclampsia either now or in a future pregnancy. Um, what messages can you send to them about what they need to be looking out for, uh, how they will be cared for, and, and what to expect? So I think the key thing about preeclampsia, Marcus, is it, it is a condition which is there and it hasn't gone away and we haven't cured it. Um, but all the evidence is, is that it, if managed correctly, um, it can be incredibly safe. Um, you know, so I, I think it's very important that we reassure women that if they can access care appropriately, get the right monitoring, um, the right clinicians to be making sensible decisions, um, th th they can have a very good outcome. It, it becomes vanishingly rare for a woman to die from preeclampsia under good care. Um, mm. And equally, although, although babies sometimes have to be delivered early, good care makes a big difference to babies being delivered early. Um, lots of drugs, lots of treatments, lots of uh, uh, interventions that, that actually improve the outcome of premature babies that just have to be delivered because the condition is serious. Um, so the message I want to get out there uh, over and over and atop the sort of background public health messages and, and so on um, is that don't be frightened to engage and seek care because that's what makes the difference. Um, our, the challenge for the health service is to make that providable, as Jenny says, and make sure everybody accesses it. I don't think we should lose sight of the fact we always kind of beat ourselves up about the bad outcomes and the inequalities. But as a country, we've done incredibly well. The inequalities elsewhere are infinitely higher, as poor, as bad as they are in the UK. And I think if we if we look at the outcomes in preeclampsia, we we also do incredibly well when we compare ourselves to our peers around the world. Um, that's just a message that good care makes a difference. Universal healthcare provision and everybody being able to access the health service is a really key feature in good preeclampsia management. And we have to make sure people have confidence in that. Thank you very much. Jenny, have you got any final messages? Uh, well, no, exactly as Andy says. I mean, you know, I think it, it does no harm um, at all during pregnancy for, for women to, to be informed. Um, and, you know, we want women, we don't want to scare women. You know, most women are not going to get preeclampsia but there are you know about five and a hundred women who will get preeclampsia and so it's really important like the other complications that can happen in pregnancy it's really important that all women you know are given some information and even though it's really hard to kind of digest all the information that's given to you at the beginning of the pregnancy you need to be able to know where to look for that information and you know what 
what should you know things about taking aspirin for example being reassured if you're advised to take aspirin making sure you ask the right questions that give you the confidence to take aspirin because it's the right thing to do for you in your pregnancy knowing about the importance of having your blood pressure monitored carefully and accurately with appropriate as Andy says, appropriate digital blood pressure machines throughout your pregnancy at your routine antenatal checks, um, and then looking for the symptoms to, to look out for um, later on in pregnancy, um, and, and knowing how to get hold of your maternity unit, um, knowing to, to speak up if you're concerned, um, and if if you genuinely don't feel that if, if you feel that something's not right, then usually as as a woman who's pregnant, you usually know best. So if something doesn't feel right and um, then seeking health care. And, and as Andy says, it's then up to the clinicians to make sure that they're doing their job properly um, and, and sticking to those really important principles and providing you know excellent care and keeping women and, and their babies safe. So be informed. That's, I guess that's the absolutely. message. Yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely. It was what I was going to say that try not to miss any of your uh, appointments. If something doesn't feel right, get it checked out. You know your body. I think those yeah. are the important messages. And it's an exciting field. There's a lot going on. There's plenty to be really, really excited about. So I'd like to thank you both for your time this evening. Uh, I'd like to thank you for for uh, all, all that you do uh, and the exciting research that you're leading uh, and look forward to more conversations with you. Now, Action on Preeclampsia has a good website, apec.org.uk. It's a brand new website. It was only launched last week, uh, and it's completely up to date with lots and lots of information for patients, for carers, for clinicians. It's all there, uh, and anything we say has been checked by clinicians, so um, we know that it's good and accurate. Uh, also invite you to look at what we're doing with Clark's campaign. Please sign the petition. Please talk to people about it. Uh, and finally, on World Preeclampsia, Day. Let's just recognise that uh, the, this disease has not gone away. Uh, there is still much to be done. Uh, and Andy and Jenny, thank you so much for being right at the heart of it. Thank you. Well, thank you both very much. Thank you. Thanks, Marcus. Thank you.